Gamergate officially hit the one-year mark recently, marking the anniversary of both the longest and the least violent zombie apocalypse in history. To commemorate this, journalist Eric Kane wrote a piece for Forbes magazine about Gamergate. Now, I should say up front that I really don't like Eric Kane very much as a journalist. He does rather a good job as a writer, but his internal bias is so over overwhelmingly strong that I find his articles to be almost worthless as anything more than fluff pieces. The glaring problem with Eric Kane in regards to his biases is that Eric openly describes himself as someone who tries to always be moderate. And like many pe pe people and like many people who claim to be moderates, he's just as blinded by it as extremists are by their extremism. There's a reason why journalists are supposed to be objective in their work. And it may seem like I'm being somewhat pedantic, but being objective is very different from being moderate or being neutral. One of the difficulties with people like Eric is that facts and truth are not necessarily moderate any more than they are necessarily extremist. If you have two extreme positions and a moderate position, the moderate position is no more likely to be true than the other two positions. It is entirely possible for one side to be entirely right and the other side entirely wrong, in which case the moderate position would be wrong as well. Or it is entirely possible for the two more extreme positions to each be somewhat correct on their own, but the combined moderate position to be entirely incorrect. Which is why it's important to look at facts, at facts objectively, not with any real desire to be one thing. In the case of Eric, because he tries to be the moderate voice, he has to consistently ignore various facts and overlook certain things that occur. He thinks he can be the voice of reason that saves everyone, but can't see that he's in many ways one of the most unreasonable people at the table. But anyways, I just wanted to get this clear so that you have some context for the article that's going to follow and my responses to it. If you happen to even listen to this, hello Mr. Kane, I wanted to have a few words with you about some of the things that you happen to write. But I'm actually fairly pressed for time this weekend, unfortunately, so I'm just going to keep this dealing with a few of the most salient points. And yeah, believe it or not, this is actually the abridged version of everything I had to say about this. But, okay, let's get started. I actually feel quite similarly about Gamergate. I sympathize with much of the frustration and irritation many in the movement feel about how their hobby is treated by the press, while at the same time believe that having this movement around simply creates more division and less productive conversation. The topic is always harassment now. The topic is always the hashtag itself. There is no middle ground. Yeah, the reason that there is no middle ground is because the other side has no desire to create a middle. As you yourself mentioned in another section of this, they label anyone who is not with them as being evil misogynists who harm women. That's why every attempt to talk to them by Gamergate has consistently failed. They don't want to talk. They want to silence. That's what started all of this. As for every topic always being harassment now, well, if you don't like it, then stop talking about it and help it to go away. This is what is called in. This is what's called art, art, trying to artificially constrain the conversation. You see, it is entirely true that the topic of Gamergate tends to be harassment, but that's only because the other side and people like you, Eric, keep bringing it up. Because that is what the other side did to deflect criticism when it was obvious that they were caught dead to rights on being unethical. That the journalists were unethical has never been in question, it's simply a fact. So they started claiming harassment and woman-hating and death threats and rape threats because they had no legitimate defense that they could make. You, Eric, and the other journalists like you are the ones that inject harassment into the, into the, into the conversation. You're the ones who want to talk about all of those rape threats and death threats and harassment, none of which are actually shown to have come from Gamergate, and then when we oblige you in order to start some sort some sort of dialogue, you try to hold it against us, claiming that all we talk about is harassment instead of ethics. 
If all of the talk of harassment bothers you so much, Eric, then shut the fuck up about it and let us talk about the ethics part that we actually want to talk about instead of making us defend ourselves against spurious and, and insubstantial claims. But don't want us to account for your failings. And, by the way, I'll note that a lot of this article of yours is really going to just focus on harassment as well, and that you'll proceed to gloss over and not mention most, most of the ethical violations and ethics, and ethics concerns that Gamergate has actually raised. But let's go on. I thought Alexander had a lot of good things to say in that article, but couched them in language designed to ignite the tempers of those she deemed their aggressive side of gaming, or in her words, these obtuse shit-slingers, these wailing hyper-consumers, these childish internet arguers. Her tactics worked beautifully. Not only did a dozen other publications riff off her Gamers Are Dead theme, gamers themselves freaked out, calling out for her to be fired, for the heads of many other game journalists to be lopped off as well. It was a boiling over moment. Even though I think Alexander's approach was wrong, I found the backlash even more troubling. She's allowed to state her opinion, and we are allowed to disagree with it, and the same is true for writers sympathetic to Gamergate. Calling for heads to roll over offense or opinion is dangerous. As someone who writes, who writes opinions for a living, I find the notion downright chilling. Well, maybe don't write clickbait articles and pass them off as fact. Just a thought. Trying to get people fired is a last resort, but for Gamergate it was the beginning. Stoked by, comp by conspiracy theories and overbold claims about ethics violations between Zoe Quinn and game journalist Nathan Grayson, Gamergate has often gone too far with its own outrageous outrage, mirroring the very tendencies among social justice warriors they claim to despise. Yeah, citation needed by the way. In fact, as a side note, I can't help but notice that there are no citations of anything or actual examples of any criticism you make about Gamergate in this article. At least none that you speak of accurately, which we'll get to in a minute. But please feel free to elaborate on what exactly Gamergate has done that mirrors the other side. I'll be waiting, and please be specific. But, okay Mr. King. You say that getting people fired should be a last resort, but it was just the beginning. Yet you also just finished writing this. Yet you also just finished writing this two paragraphs earlier. Indeed, Gamergate itself was born out of outrage, or rather, the accumulation of many justified grievances, coalescing into one huge hysterical fit of outrage over an article written by Lay Alexander at, Ga at Gama Sutra, following the Zoe Quinn debacle. So, you just finished admitting that there have been a long list of justified issues and grievances which have built up over a long period of time. Then, do a complete turnaround and attempt to claim that Gamergate just called for firings out of the, well, out of the gate. Does this not seem a little inconsistent to you? By your own admission, these complaints and issues have been going on for a long time. Years, in fact. You call yourself a games journalist, so you should know this. Or maybe the fact that you yourself are a games journalist is why you're trying to ignore it now. But that's for another time. You also admit that Leigh Alexander deliberately wrote an article with an attempt to be inflammatory and insulting towards her audience and consumers, which was then repeated by over a dozen other major game publications and you were surprised that people got profoundly pissed off when that was the exact reason they were trying when that was the exact reaction they were trying to create eric in any intelligently run company if somebody had done what she did she would have been out the door so fast all you would have seen is an overweight booze swilling blur believe it or not most companies don't like it when their employees try to drive away their customers but no clearly it's the gamers who were in the wrong they were stoked by conspiracy theories, and by conspiracy theories you mean well-proven facts that you should have plenty of evidence for if you, had, if you were actually looking for them. All of those conspiracies were confirmed to be true by the people who were accused of doing them, like the Game Journal's Pro List. It's not a conspiracy theory when it is factually true. For someone who has been following Gamergate all year, 
you seem remarkably ill-educated on the particular chain of events that led to this. You seem to have chosen not to acknowledge the fact that this did not start with cries for heads to roll. This started with discussion and criticism, which were then subsequently banned, blocked, deleted, or responded to with cries of misogyny. Remember how one subreddit deleted over 2,000 tweets in a single thread? Or the subreddits that were taken down and the people that were banned? Remember the Kotakus and the Polygons that banned all discussion of the matter and removed anyone who tried to talk about it? Remember that, Mr. Kane? You say that we are allowed to disagree with Leigh Alexander, but no, we weren't allowed to disagree with her, or any of them. Anyone that voiced a disagreement was censored immediately, doxxed, and or slandered as misogynists who wanted to keep women out of gaming. Even the mainstream news outlets specifically and deliberately censored and slandered us. With the entire public dialogue locked down, I have to ask, exactly how was anyone ever allowed to disagree? Maybe that's why people were demanding that the heads of the people responsible should roll, as you put it, as opposed to just because we disagreed with them, you think. The existence of the blockbot instituted by Anti-Gamergate, which prevents a few thousand people from ever interacting with them. A block list, which also includes those who follow those people, shows that they do not allow disagreement, made all the more obvious that those same people who use the block bot still yell at, criticize, and lie about us to our faces, yet use the block bot so that we cannot respond back to them, giving them freedom to speak while not having to hear others speak in return. Where was the allowance for disagreement in that? Christina Hoff Summers, Kathy Young, Milo Yiannopoulos, Adam Baldwin, etc. have been vilified as misogynist woman haters and just plain evil only for associating with us. When Brianna Wu, one of their own group, sat down for coffee with Brad Wardell and she came away saying that he wasn't that bad of a guy, she was crucified by her own side up until she got back in line with the group. Where exactly is the opportunity for disagreement in this? This whole thing happened specifically because we are not allowed to disagree with their narrative. You seem to be confusing capacity for allowance. As long as we have free will, then yes, we have the capacity to disagree, but we are not allowed to disagree, at least not in their eyes. And the journalistic media, especially the game's journal especially the game's journalistic media, has been backing that up, which is what led to this. Gamergate began because there was no other outlet for disagreement besides Revolution. As I mentioned in one of my first videos on Gamergate way back then, this all would have been avoided if they hadn't tried to silence us. But, being a games journalist, I'm sure you knew all about that already, you just didn't bother to mention it for some reason. Well, we all know the reason. The part that I find the most amusing, and certainly the most telling as well, is that in the case of Leigh Alexander, you were directed in the comments section of your article to her page on Deep Freeze that listed many of the things that she has done to which you responded by saying that you saw nothing unethical in what she has done. Are you serious? No, really. Are you actually and truly serious? Because... I went over to the Society of Professional Journalists and took a look at their page on journalistic ethics and did a count. I stopped once I reached the 10th violation, just because I realized how long it was going to take if I actually tried to count them all up. But, just to give you some of the highlights, we have Avoid conflicts of interest, real or perceived. Disclose unavoidable conflicts. Refuse gifts, favors, fees, free travel, and special treatment, and avoid political and other outside activities that may compromise integrity or impartial impartiality or may damage credibility. Encourage a civil dialogue with the public about journalistic practices, coverage, and news content. Acknowledge mistakes and correct them promptly and prominently. Explain corrections and clarifications Clarif and carefully and clearly. Expose unethical conduct in journalism, including within their organizations, etc., etc., etc. Do you need me to go on? 
and you actually can't see her behavior as entirely unethical. Um, in addition to regularly writing and speaking about feminism, um, I reject as much as possible conventional models for video games writing. Um, you know, you can't be a female columnist or like a woman who writes her opinions without people making referendums on your personality or speculating about your motives or even your mental health. So I just double down on doing personal work. Um, <laughs> whether I'm doing in interviews, criticism, anything, no pretense of being unbiased. I write about the things I'm interested in, the creators I care about, and the trends that I want to see succeed. Sorry, that's the conspiracy. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Um, I'm absolutely proud, you know, to advance amazing creators and conversations that I think matter to games. Yeah, I have an, I have an agenda, sorry. Um, I did a feature for Nylon Magazine, for example, about Nina Freeman. Uh, she's an independent game developer. She, calls, she makes these small games. She calls them vignette games, um, and they're about girlhood, you know, for example. Um, I did a piece for The New Inquiry about Merit Copas's, um consensual torture simulator, which is about consent and embodiment in games, um, and it's a study on violence in games um, in an intimate context. Um, I have a vice column called Understanding Games, which is just stuff I'm thinking about when it comes to mainstream games. Um, and the story that Andy was telling you about was speculative fiction on the Atari dig that was um, written as if I'd gone, kind of, and then I just made up a story about it <laughs> that said what I wanted to say. About what, were you just asleep that day in journalism class? Was the subject matter just not sucking you in? I assume you learned about journalism from somewhere because you call yourself a journalist in your bio even though you at other times say that you're actually just a critic in your eyes, because no dishonesty there. But even if you want to just portray yourself as a critic, shouldn't you actually have some knowledge about what you're criticizing? If you're going to talk about a movement dealing with ethics and journalism, you should, I don't know, maybe understand journalistic ethics? You have... Gamergate started because the people like you, who call themselves journalists, apparently neither know nor care about actual journalism. You actually sat there behind your keyboard and told one of your readers that you saw nothing unethical when directed to a page that shows Lay Alexander doing literally the exact opposite things that the ethical standards say she should be doing. I can't imagine why people are pissed at you guys. The specific examples often raised by Gamergate are less crucial to me than the bigger picture. But since its inception, Gamergate has missed the forest for the trees. It has been all about specific personalities within the industry, both game journalists and cultural critics like Anita Sarkeesian, and about specific narrow examples rather than about how to create a better gaming press. Bullshit. But I'll get to that in a second. First off, I wanted to ask exactly why you think we should be telling you how to be a better gaming press, it's your own damn jobs. We're just asking you to actually do them properly. You're not being asked to be a better gaming press. You're ask you're not being asked to be a better gaming press. You're being asked to be a gaming press in the first place. What we have now is a group of political and social ideologues trying to use games to push a, to push a social political agenda on everyone else and a dishonest media that is shielding them from criticism. You say that you're not anti-Gamergate, yet you're a journalist who doesn't even know journalistic ethics, nor seemingly follow them. So if you're that bad off, imagine what the others are actually like. I may not be a mechanic, Eric, but when I get my car back and it's all duct taped up with the rear taillight smash and two tires missing, I know that someone was not doing their job. And this, Eric, is the bigger picture. Games media is filled with people like Leigh Alexander, people like Totilo, people like you who are uninterested in doing the jobs that they were hired for. And because they aren't doing their jobs, people want to see them fired and way made for those who are actually interested in doing the job. That's why nobody in Gamergate is raking places like The Escapist over the coals, because they're actually doing their damn jobs. And as another side note, Eric, I'll note that at no point in this do you make any attempt to talk about how to create a better gaming press. Now, Koretsky, whatever else you want to say about him, actually made an effort to fix things as a journalist. He tried to set up airplay so that we could actually do this sort of thing. And because Gamergate is an amorphous, leaderless movement as concerned with SJWs as it is with ethics, we're not. 
there has never been a proper decision as to exactly what its grievances are and what precisely its, eth its ethics complaints may be. Yeah, and here's where I call liar liar pants and fire on you, Eric. What about Deep Freeze? What about Airplane, which you yourself mentioned earlier at the start of this article? These things have been laid out as laid out ad nauseum whenever people asked. People like you just never seem to bother to listen. Which is likely why you think that Gamergate can't see the forest for the trees, because you're too busy trying to trying to watch your own navel. These things have been talked about over and over again. As for those specific personalities that you mentioned, they come up because they are the ones specifically attacking us. They are the ones who are causing the problems that we are attempting to fix. When anti-gamergate tries to label us as all a bunch of woman-hating misogynists, those people are the ones that they point to as the ones we're victimizing. And you're surprised that we talk about them. Really? They're being forced down our throats at every turn. That's why we stopped calling them by name and just called them the literal, the literally who's because we wanted to stop them getting attention. Again, we would be only too happy to stop talking about this if you would stop trying to put these artificial constraints on the conversation. The media brings these irrelevant people up, not us. They're the ones letting Sarkeesian get up on stage and talk about how she receives bomb threats from Gamergate despite there being not the slightest iota of evidence to show that. And then they, and I mean you too, stand around and shake your head and claim that talking about harassment and the people being harassed is an intrinsic part of Gamergate, and not because you keep bringing it up and hitting us over the head with it. Again, don't hold us accountable for your own inequities. Too many allegiances have formed, and too many biases are being confirmed. Yeah, like yours. It's too easy to say site X that agrees with us is, un is ethical, and site Y that doesn't is not. And sure, some sites like the, like the Escapist have made moves towards transparency, which is great, and that site in particular is beloved by Gamergate. But other sites like Polygon have done just as much to create transparency and openness, and because they're perceived as SJW bastions, they're despised. Again, bullshit. What exactly did Polygon and Kotaku do to create transparency and openness? No, seriously, I really want to know your answer to this one, because apparently it wasn't important enough to actually mention or give an example of here. As for being perceived as bastions, there is no perception. They are, which is why they are despised. I'm curious as to why you seem surprised that a place that is a central staple of the corrupt journalism unethical practices, lies, and misinformation, and progressive extremism that is being fought against is despised by the people that they are attacking and who are fighting against them. In fact, this is a general trend throughout your narrative here. You keep trying to act as though gamers just woke up one morning and decided that Polygon and their elk was shit for no reason whatsoever, and it just baffles you. Like you missed the entire last year of constant threats, doxing, racist comments, censorship, and outright hate mongering. Did you notice all those times throughout the last year that we tried to talk to Polygon and Kotaku? That we tried to speak with their editors and to engage in conversation with them? We spoke to their parent companies. We tried to arrange for a table where both sides could sit down. They consistently and every time refused to do it. That's why there were no antis at Airplay. It's not that they didn't get an invite. It's that they refused to come and discuss in a free and open environment where they can't just attack us. They still attack us to this day. So why are you trying so hard to portray this as though they have done nothing to bring this upon themselves? Say what you will about Gawker as a whole, and no doubt Kotaku has published some questionable things in the past. Some? But it also has some of the best video game reporting out there. Steven Totillo and Jason Scryer are two of the best video game reporters in the business and have a deep pool of context and sources to draw on. You mean the same Jason Scryer who compared asking for ethics to the Ebola virus? The one who lied about poll results? The one who, when Gamergate, caught the man who was responsible for much of the harassment of Anita Sarkeesian and other women, twisted the story and blamed Gamergate for causing his action? The one who started the Dragon Crown moral panic with his scandal mongering, 
and Tatilo? Eric, the fact that you will publicly say that Schreier and Tatilo are two of the best in the business either indicates sad and horrible things about you and your integrity, or sad and horrible things about the state of the games industry. For the sake of the industry, I hope it's just you. More disclosure, often a banner cry of Gamergate is all fine and good, and certainly a step in the right direction. An end to pain to paid travel across game journalism would be another nice step, but the fact remains that game journalism is trade journalism, and we game journalists walk hand in hand with, hand with industry PR. We make contacts in the industry, and we peddle hype. And investigative long-form journalism is expensive and challenging to support. Yes, and all you're being asked to do is tell us about it beforehand. I'm sorry if that's slightly inconvenient to you, but ethics usually are. That's why ethical people are so much more respected. As for your complaint about actual journalism being hard, allow me to present to you the world's tiniest violin. actually do the job properly, you shouldn't have signed on for it. And when we don't, when we criticize the industry or its products, we're often met with just as much backlash by readers and gamers. When an SJW critic complains about poor representation of women in games, they're lambasted by gamers for messing with art, while at the same time criticized for being corrupt in the pockets of developers. Yes, because both are true. They are trying to mess with art, they flat out admit this. They admit they want to use gaming and media as a tool to reshape the culture, and they are also corrupt and in the pockets of developers at the same time. The problem is not because you're criticizing the industry, the problem is because the criticism is factually untrue, ideologically biased, unfounded, and generally extremely stupid. Because, Eric, there is no way that you can be writing this article with any degree of honesty, because I've read your other stuff. And you simply cannot be as profoundly ignorant as you are writing here. This is patently dishonest on your part. I thought if I, th if I thought you understood ethics, I think you would be rightly ashamed of yourself. But Gamergate takes a similarly negative approach to game journalism. It's far too often about getting people fired. Yeah, because they don't do their jobs, which is apparently a novel concept to you. About shutting down the opinions of those they disagree with. Where did anyone do this? Instead of simply supporting and pushing for more voices they support. The escapist, base gamer, total biscuit, niche gamer, the fine young capitalist, and all the other things Gamergate has supported, which you apparently don't know about because you've been doing such a crackerjack job in your job as a journalist. I believe in a positive approach, which is why you've been negative and deceitful throughout this. I believe in loving your enemy and not wishing them harm, and I believe in criticism, even of those we, we support. Criticism is not the problem, it's that what most games journalists call criticism, normal people would call lying and deception. I think it's galling that so few in the games press offer up a critique of Sarkeesian, that certain people have become off-limits simply because they've faced harassment from trolls, but I find it equally galling to hear people accuse game writers of corruption simply because they're offering up a social justice critique of a game. They aren't Eric. Try and follow us here. They are being accused of corruption because they are colluding to silence all dissent, smearing critics, and trying to further a separate agenda. In other words, they are being accused of corruption because they are, in fact, corrupt. Well, that and the fact that their criticisms are again unfactual, untrue, and can easily be shown to be wrong by anyone who actually plays video games. I tend to take a moderate position on all these concerns. Yeah, I know. And here's the core problem here, Eric. 
you're suffering from a very strong moderate bias. This is why you look at facts and this is why you look at facts and reality, not with an attempt to be any one thing. You should not take a moderate position because you want to be a hippie stoner kumbaya freak. You should take a moderate position because the evidence leads to that being the proper conclusion, assuming it does. Instead, you have to completely redefine facts and events to suit your inner narrative, while expecting everyone else to just get along here. This is not going to happen, Eric. We were not the ones that burned these bridges. We're just the ones that are having to finish the job. Anyways, I could go on for quite a while, but I think you get the general gist of what the article is like. I'll talk to you guys later.